hello and welcome uh, to today's panel on empowering frontline employees and store teams, sponsored by Microsoft and hosted by George Mason University Center for Retail Transformation. My name is Dr. Gautam Vatkepat. I'm an associate professor. I'm a dean scholar and director for the center. And in our effort to try and highlight the transformation of retail, I'm delighted to host this panel. We're going to talk about the opportunities and challenges to empowering the frontline employees and store teams and talk about the role that technology and analytics has to play in empowering these uh, stores. So thank you for the audience who is who are trickling in for this live conversation. Thank you to the panelists who have taken time off and have joined us from not only different parts of the country, but from different parts of the world uh, to share your exp experiences and expertise on this topic. Uh, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A session to post the questions. The chat stream is active. Please weigh in on topics as you hear them. And so without further ado, let me get started and let's go around and meet our wonderful panelists. And maybe we'll go around in alphabetical order and kick things off. So Christiana, the floor is yours. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, hello, everyone, and good afternoon. Um, my name is Christiana DiMatessa. I'm with Under Armour. Uh, I've been with Under Armour for about eight years. Prior to that, I was with uh, Ann Taylor and Loft on the full price and the outlet side. And before that, I spent uh, 15 years with Foot Locker Inc. So um, grew up through the, the field, through working in Foot Locker stores into corporate positions. So currently at Under Armour, um, I manage our DTC omni-channel team for uh, omni-channel marketing team for the Americas, which is North America and Latin America. And that is um, marketing strategy, in-store experience, on-site content, uh, field marketing, uh, as well as experiential marketing. Anything you missed? Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm sure I'm sure that more will be added later. <laughs> Perfect. Well, welcome. Thank you, Christiana, for making time. Chris, the floor is yours. Sure. Uh, nice to see everybody. And uh, my name is Chris Todd. I'm the one of the co-founders and CEO of Theatro. Uh, we are a fast-growing mobile platform designed specifically for frontline teams based out of Dallas, Texas. We're in our 10th year of operation. Um, we build mobile apps for and digital workflows uh, that are combined with a free IoT little mobile device for, for the frontline. Um, we've got uh, 420,000 uh, workers, everyday users, uh, using our platform across 12,700 and odd stores in, um, in North and uh, Central America. And we've been very honored to uh, be voted by tier one retailers um, in the annual RIS survey as the number one software company of innovation for the second year in a row with perfect score. So very excited to uh, uh, talk about this top topic because it's uh, very germane to what we do as a business. So, glad to see everybody. Well, thank you, Chris. I will have to talk a lot about what what you're doing in transforming the retail um, environment. Julian, hi. I'm um, great to be. I'm Julian Mills, CEO of Corso. Corso is an intelligent platform for store managers and district managers, and essentially, we try to help those folk who are just hugely busy at the moment running much more omni-channel stores by um, turning all the data and reports and tasks, et cetera, they get into personalized work for each of them each day. So we turn all of that kind of information into either the top 10, what we call missions for each people, each person each day. Um, and we then show them how they are actually improving the performance of their store by completing those missions. Okay, so that's what we do. It's great to be here. Sadly, we're not yet number one rated software company in the world or whatever Chris was. But Chris, I look forward to challenging you next year on that. <laughs> Good. I lo love Good. the friendly rivalry. That's perfect. And important, Ju Julian, what you're doing as well, right? With the deluge of information. How do you pass the information? That's wonderful. Sue, thank you. Yours. Thank you. And hello, everybody. Glad to be with you here today. I'm Sue McMahon. I'm an industry advisor for retail and consumer goods at Microsoft. Um, I've been in this role about five years, but the team that I'm on is a team of practitioners that have come out of industry, like many of you today. Um, 
prior to joining Microsoft about five years ago, I was with Macy's over 25 years, um, all on the business side, ran individuals, department stores early in my career, moved into corporate to help with store comms, workload scheduling, project management, uh, senior leadership support, et cetera, and so on. So very germane topic today more than ever. And I'm glad to be here to share the, this great brain trust with you today. <laughs> That's wonderful. And so like, uh, thank, thank you for making time. Thanks to each of you for making time. So what we try to do here in the center's panels to kind of kick things off is to kind of get a pulse of what people think about the topic, right? So there's all, retail is the largest private sector employer. You have over 6 million people who work in the front line just in the U.S. That's just grocery and convenience, uh, right? Um, so how important are frontline employees and store teams in general to the success of physical retail? We'll just go around the room talking to the retailers first. Sue, why don't you kick things off since you were last to introduce yourselves? <laughs> Thank you. Happy to. You know, it's interesting because, um, and this was alluded to earlier, it's not just physical retail anymore that the frontline workers and the store teams are dealing with. They're dealing with the entire breadth of omni-channel. Um, they're fulfilling digital demand from, from websites and mobile commerce and social commerce in the store. Um, so they're becoming a mini kind of fulfillment center as well as, um, you know, working with consumers that actually come into the stores to make a purchase. So it is very complicated. Um, it's There's a lot on their plates um, and they've become even more important than ever, just enterprise wide to a, being a successful retailer for that reason. Christiana, do you have anything sure. to add? Oh yeah, I definitely do. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, coming from a marketing perspective, right? I mean, uh, you know, we have to drive a brand and a business, right? And uh, you need both. And I think we often forget sometimes that the frontline workers, they are the, they represent your brand, right? They can actually make or break all of your millions of dollars you're spending on marketing, right? So you can push out these major campaigns, launching a new shoe. This is the greatest running shoe in the world, blah, blah, blah. Come to a store. If you are not educating a teammate in store to know all about their product and why it's important to the brand, to the business, and someone comes in and says, oh, what about this new shoe? And they say, hmm, I tried it on. I don't really like it what just happened to all of your marketing investment, right? Like we have to make sure that we are empowering them with the right information to not only drive our business and say, here are the KPIs you need to hit, but also here's what's important to our brand. And you, we need you to communicate that as frontline worker to the, to the customers. I love that fact that they are ambassadors for the brand, right? Essentially, mm -hmm. Chris. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, I think that, I mean, if you, if you really think about it, if, uh, if you didn't have physical stores or if everybody wanted to buy everything online, they would just buy it online. But the reality is we have physical stores because um, of the consumer, they want to actually interact with humans. They, humans like to buy from humans and they like to have conversations with them. What, what a customer really just, if, they, if, you, if you make it really simple, what do they want? Good eye to eye contact, somebody to be present, somebody to be pleasant and have useful information that answers their questions. That sounds really simple, but it's actually very complex because we're challenging, you know, the store teams, the frontline teams to cr help create these memorable experiences in stores, which is really, if you look at it from a process flow or so forth, is really a sequence of events that have to be orchestrated and performed by the frontline team members in a consistent and timely way in order to pull it all off. And that's actually really challenging. I mean, it puts a big a big burden on them and it makes it uh, you know especially challenging if if they don't know what the plan is they don't know what the objectives are they're not connected to the uh, the organization overall excellent julian any thoughts well no disagreement here so um i think they're hugely important you know 85 percent of retail sales in the u.s go through stores you know globally retail is an 85 so it's a 25 trillion dollar industry <laughs> So, you know, these people deliver $20 trillion or so of sales every year. So they're much more important than most of us, to be honest. Um, and I think great retailers recognize that. You know, I'm very struck, EG Group, you know, one of the fastest growing retailers out there, you know, have organized their whole organization really around the store manager. You know, the store manager is the star. They are the striker. They are, you know, the, you know, the, the, the star pitcher. And everyone else in the business is really at their service. And I think it's very interesting to see retailers start to think about that. And I think it's very exciting that, you know, we are discussing this kind of topic now because we wouldn't have been discussing this five years ago. 
Yeah, I mean, and they play multiple roles, right? Like they are the ambassadors, they're the emergency response team when yeah. things go wrong. They actually ensure that things are in supply. So they play, they put on multiple different hats and they ensure that the economy was running when we were dealing with really hard times. So let's let's pivot. So we, there's no debating the importance of this, at least amongst the panelists, right? They are the glue that holds retail together. Not I remove the physical part. I agree with Sue. It's both the physical and the digital aspect. But if you think about this, the topic for today is empowering frontline employees and store teams, right? Fundamentally, my belief is that to empower store teams, you need to be able to recruit and retain the right talent that fits your company's ethos. But if you look at retail, as with almost every sector, you're facing a lot of headwinds when it comes to recruitment and retaining these talents, right? Retail, the turnover rate is about 3.7. And if you include hospitality, it's 5.7. You have about, if I remember correctly, the Deloitte study that just came out, at 74% of the retailers felt that they would not be able to hire customer-facing uh, employees. And you have so many job op options that even if you get the unemployed retail experience workers to work in retail, you still have 50% vacancies. Right. So how do retailers address this critical problem of attracting and retaining frontline employees? Let's let's spend some time. We actually got this request via email even before the panel happened. Like, hey, can you address this question? So can we just talk a little bit about this? And again, we'll maybe this time we'll start with Christiana, if you could kick us off. Yeah, um, I mean, this one is definitely uh, pretty close to my heart here. Um, in particular, uh, so you know, I, I don't oversee our field team. I oversee a field marketing team. So I have I have Under Armour marketers that are placed in key cities where that are very important to us for our business, where we have main retailers, both DTC and wholesale partners, um, to represent our brand to make sure that whoever is selling our product on the sales floor is educated on it, right? And educated on our brand. I think though, selfishly, uh, you know, there obviously is an importance of of field marketing. But for me, like the biggest thing was in retail where I see a gap is being able to take very loyal brand fans that work for us and be able to grow them into, into corporate careers, right? I mean, I think that we're doing ourselves a disservice in the industry if we aren't taking those people that know our customer better than anyone and establishing a way for them to grow into corporate teammates, right? And um, so with that being said, for 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 my side, for marketing, what I did was I created a program. The field marketing program is to take top talent out of retail stores. And that doesn't mean just my own. I just hired someone from a competitor who has 10 years in management at a, a competitor brand, but knows the industry, knows the customers. And the thing is, like, they need an opportunity. I For, for someone that, again, grew up in the retail industry and worked in stores, it was so hard to get anyone to just acknowledge you to give you a corporate position, even an entry level role. Like, why? Why are we doing that? Right. So I think the important thing here is and, and I've seen the change. I've just recently hired four people out of our own and operated retail onto my marketing team because we've gotten out there. We put field marketers out there and they're talking to the teammates all day long and they're saying, hey, if you're interested in a career like follow along with me, see, start to learn. And then there's an opportunity. For that type of role, I hire for heart and then I train for marketing. Hire for heart and train for marketing. And it's a really cool thing that you're doing. You know, we are an academic institution and I can tell you that's a major problem. Students work in retail, but then they don't want careers in retail simply because of that, right? That they don't have that pathways to corporate careers. So thank you for what you're doing. Uh, so you've got vast experience in this, right? So what, what are your thoughts on this issue? Yeah, so, you know, the way I think about it, today's um, frontline workforce in retail are digital natives when they come into the job. They already have a smartphone in their pocket <laughs> that they use every day. Um, and then they get to work in a retail environment, store or warehouse or wherever, and there is very little technology for them to use to be more effective in their jobs. Um, and when they do get a new piece of technology, maybe a new, you know, Honeywell or Zebra device or something they get to work with, there's very little training that goes along with it. Um, they have to figure out how to push the buttons and get the job done on their own most of the time. Um, you know, Microsoft does a, a work trends index every year where we survey um, work, uh, employees all over the globe. Um, and we focused it in the end of last year on frontline workers. And we, we interviewed about 9,600 of them across, across many 
many countries um, across multiple industries. But one of the things that jumped out at me was that, you know, when, when we asked them, there's a tremendous level of stress in working on the front lines of retail. There always has been. It's grown even greater in the last several years with what we've been through with COVID and lockdowns and all the pr protocols that had to be followed, um, not to mention being concerned about getting sick. But it, of, of all the things that they they said could reduce stress in their jobs on the front line. The number three most um, popular one actually was better technology tools to make my job easier. That, that came after a pay increase and paid time off, <laughs> but that was number three. So, so clearly there's, a, there's an eagerness for not only being able to be more effective in your job using technology, but also to learn about new technology to, to upskill um, your own behaviors and, and, and experience. There's music to my ears as an academic, right? Both of you have talked about education and training uh, as one of the key things to recruit and retain. And that's what the center here tries to do. Uh, Chris, why don't you weigh in on this? I, I saw you nodding extensively when, when she talked about the cell phones and everyone using it. Well, I mean, it's actually uh, very true. I think at the, you know, when we look at the issue of retention um, and so forth, um, I, I was uh, I was pleased. I saw a recent McKinsey survey and analysis that just came out, um, which I thought was quite an interesting. It showed that there's actually a fundamental disconnect between what employees want in a job versus what employers think employees want in a job and, and value about their position. And I was actually quite surprised because the traditional thought by many uh, retailers is that employees when in the survey was employees want higher pay or a better job. And in reality, the highest thing that was rated uh, by the employees themselves was that they are valued by their manager and they feel uh, a, a part of the organization. And they felt like those were very important things for longevity in their career and their, you know, in their, uh, their staying power. And, and uh, I think that's really hard for many employers because it's the softer behavioral type things. It's easy to, to uh, for an employer to uh, to talk about pay or to talk about uh, you know performance reviews and that kind of stuff. It's it's a little bit more difficult when you get into things like communications, recognition, engagement. All of those things are are really hard when you have a geographically dispersed organization run by managers. That each manager is their own leader, their own style, and their own own uh, objectives. And I think as anybody that's been in retail knows, there's that's one of the biggest challenges across a a large organization is the inconsistency amongst managers interpreting a direction and so forth. And so when you look at that and say, all right, if employees really value the interaction, the relationship, the engagement, how do I do that consistently? Um, that's, uh, that, that's where I think there's an unlock for, for what's going on in the marketplace as far as re, you know, retention of uh, what employees in a tight labor market. Yeah, and like talk again, connecting to the students part of things, right? Like they, they all want to be part of something bigger, right? Yeah. They want to be, they want to, I mean, everyone, like forget the students, everyone wants to be feel part of something bigger, to be tied to each other. So, and how do you get that? That, that will be the next stage of our conversation. But Julian, what are your thoughts to, what's the key challenges to hiring and retaining? the right? Well, I, I think Chris makes a really interesting point. I mean, clearly there are some retailers out there who have extraordinary brands you know, and everyone wants to work for. But, you know, we're not all that lucky. Um, and I think that, um, that there are a couple of things. I think, first of all, um, we need to accept that there will be greater turnover, yeah, in, for many retailers. There just will be greater kind of employee um, movement. In fact, I think, you know, the, at the moment, the average store and district manager has been enrolled um, for less than 18 months at that company. Okay, so that's a pivotal role, you know, that's, I would argue, not a lot of experience for that role right now. Um, I think the second thing that really resonated um, is this point of showing people, you know, how they're contributing to the business, how they're part of some bigger whole. And so from speaking parochially, I mean, one of the things that we care a lot about at Corso is we try and show people the impact of every action they take. And on average, every time someone does something in a store, you know, they replen the cookies or they rotate the salad bags or whatever it is 
they typically drive about 150 to 200 dollars of extra sales that week yeah so we can show them that and we go hey look you're here you did this it worked yeah and then i think the third thing is just taking the stress out of people's life you know people are so busy at the moment running these very complex stores and i think you know one of the things we hear is people are using 30 plus different systems every week you know they've been given 40 different tasks etc to do a day etc we need to cut down on the load that we're giving people or else they're going to burn out totally totally agree well i that's think a, on the, on the, that's on an excellent side, point oh, sorry on the flip side of that too i think that there's some things that we need to do from the corporate side with our field teammates of like if you work in a role that is responsible for the field or doing anything to drive the business in the field, like you should be out in the field yourself. If you're sitting behind your computer every day, you you got a problem, right? You can only innovate so much within your own four walls. Um, but when it comes down to it of like, you know, I, I've seen it. I've seen it no matter, it, I'm not speaking just about my company, any other companies, when you go through and if we walk through stores, I mean, everyone's talking about, we should do this, we should do that, but we need to, open up the forum way more to say, what can we do? What do you need? Because I think a lot of times is like when we are behind our computers and we're figuring out, oh, we need to do this for the stores. And then they're saying, hey, no one buys that because we they actually shop earlier. Like let's use back to school, for example. Hey, our market back to school started a month before. So everything you deliver for back to school isn't selling because of that. Like if we knew this information and we gave the forum to our field frontline employees to share that feedback back to us and they saw us listening to that and making changes, like yeah. that is empowerment for them. Like how do we incorporate them instead of us dictating what, you know, what, what we want them to do? And again, that's not, this is industry wide. Like we need, we need to treat them like equals. Nobody's bigger than the brand, right? No matter if you're a, a senior director or a store manager or a part-time teammate, what you do matters to the overall brand. Yeah. I, 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 oh, I'm sorry. Sue, please go for it. I was going to say, I couldn't agree with that more. And then, you know, back in the day when I was a store manager, I always um, told all my people, all my managers in, in the store, if you are concerned about a business that you run, um, if you're concerned why you're not selling something, if you're concerned why things don't seem to be working in this particular part of the store that you own, all the answers you need are out on the floor. Sell side by side on a Saturday afternoon, on a busy Saturday um, with your frontline workers, and they will tell you and the customers will tell you everything you need to know to fix that business. And it, it is still true today, and it's true for corporate workers as well. You're absolutely right. Um, but we don't spend enough time doing that. Um, and, and also, you know, it, it, there's all this um, concern about scale and how can I possibly, as a senior leader in corporate, um, scale to the feedback of all of these hundreds of, or even thousands or tens of thousands of frontline workers. There are tools today that can help you do that. Um, we have them at Microsoft. I know Corso has them as well. Um, so, so there's definitely technology tools that can help in all of these situations. Julian, you were about to say something. Well, no, I, I, I was going to say, I mean, Sue and Christiana, I think are so spot on. I totally agree. I mean, to me, it makes no sense to spend lots of money on market research and then ignore what, you know, a thousand store associates tell you. So. Yeah, and I always used to say, right, your, your frontline employees are your market research tool, right? I mean, in essence, they can tell you before things go wrong, what's going to go wrong and what's going well, as Christiana just said. So it's an untapped potential. So, so this like wrapping things up uh, on this topic, is there anything else that we want to think about, want to discuss when it comes to hiring and retaining? We talked about the technology aspect. We talked about reducing stress. We talked about actually feeling part of a bigger picture, uh, kind of a part of an organization. We talked about the education aspect of things. Is there anything else that we need to cover when it comes to actually being able to retain talent because I was bothered to be honest when Julian said that hey we're going to actually have more attrition moving forward uh, and, and that is a concern for me like what can we do to solve that attrition because at this point I think it's 80 percent turnover right is is some of the average statistics so I mean like are we going to get to 100 percent like that and if it's 18 months then you're spending a lot of money in cost training people right so is there anything else that we can do to keep people in-house and build that core asset that we need. I mean, I, 
don't know. Uh, well, I don't want to comment necessarily on retaining, uh, but I want to comment on acquiring because I think this is a very interesting shift, at least from the marketing side of things of like, you know, from marketing, we've always been a part of hiring in terms of like, can you produce a POP sign for the stores that says we're hiring, right? But when it comes down to it, this has been the first time where it said marketing, we need help with hiring, right? More so than ever before, like people just coming in and putting a sign up, we need something further than that. So it's been very interesting to, um, you know, to honestly, to bring my team to the table and say, what do we use for our own marketing tools to drive our business? And how would we think about how we apply those to help with hiring? And, um, you know, we did a test recently with a, um, there's a startup company quickly out of Detroit that um, does urgency marketing. And we use them a lot for, um, you know, some of our data acquisition, um, uh, activations, new store opening activations. And we said, how can we use, you know, incentive marketing and urgency marketing uh, to, to drive acquisition of teammates to stores? So. Instead, we went, you know, in the stock room and we said, hey, teammates, we're going to put this out there. We're going to have a contest and we're going to use this platform. And here's all you need to do is share this out with your friends and family. And if you really enjoy working for this brand, put it out there in your social channels, put it out there via email. And basically we looked at, we looked at um, the traffic to our career site and was linked to each person had their own link from as a store associate. So we could see who was driving the most traffic to the career site. And so, although we couldn't fully link it all on the back end to the actual hiring, it, we, we did reward the teammates that drove the most interest through their own personal network. Because what we saw there, it wasn't just a tactic. It was the fact that like, if someone's really proud of where they work and they want to tell their friends and family about it, like let's give them the tools to do that. Okay. Yeah, that's a great point. So go ahead. I couldn't agree more. And I love Jennifer's comment in the chat about yeah. creating partnership at field level, um, you know, for, for, at Macy's, I was a very big proponent of that. Everything doesn't have to trickle down from corporate. These are very smart people that we've hired to run the field organization. They can make decisions. And there, but there was a lot of empowerment that we did um, you know, when I was there. And I know they still continue to do. Uh, but what I would say is also, and, and, I, and I love what Christiana just said about um, marketing and how do you market to acquire talent as just as you market to acquire customers. First, you have to have employees that are proud to work for your brand and for your company and that really want to bring their friends along. At Macy's, what we knew was that employees that were referred by other employees were much more likely to stay and be successful at Macy's. So, and, and in able to, to be able to get to that in this day and age, you need to invest in your frontline workers and their managers much more than, than retail has in the past. So, and I think they're starting to realize that and starting to understand that the investment that they make will be returned in terms of retention and hiring and all of those things, but you really have to put your money where your mouth is as a retailer to, to, to get to that point. I agree. And I was going to say, Gotham, you know, one of the things we talk, I mean, Sue mentioned earlier about many of these uh, employees are very technology forward, right? And yet mm -hmm. they're in an environment that's not. Um, and you look at what's the investment that the employer is making on behalf of the employee, right? Um, the reality is most technology solutions that actually are purchased by retailers are actually for the managers to manage employees, they're not actually for the employees themselves. And if you're going to make the investment in, in employees are getting very smart at that. They look at what is the intent of this and what is their role. And if you look at, if you try to meet their needs, which says, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to actually invest in my employees to make it their life better, make their contributions better. That's really what digital transformation is all about. I mean, today, sad to say, only a third of actually frontline employees have a mobile device to use while they're at work. And so if you want to get that feedback, you want to go get their input, you literally would have to walk around to find them. And that's just inefficient and it's impractical. And so the idea of like, we need to connect everybody. Everybody needs to be on the corporate network so that the folks at headquarters can get feedback and get that input. And it's on a single system where everybody is free. We, you break down the barriers of communications. That's gonna be just uh, the, the key to making a lot of the, the new employees wanna work in those organizations. And I, I think it will end up in a, you know, kind of there'll be winners and losers based on who's willing to invest in employees and who's not. And some people, unfortunately, won't be able to, to, to do that. And the, and, the, and the ones that do will benefit because you will get that rich feedback at the street level or at the, at the store level, which actually helps them, you know, do across the entire enterprise.
Yeah, gr great point, right? I mean, it's about connecting everyone and it's not a one directional conversation. It's a bi-directional conversation as in real time as well, if possible, right? Um, so so we have already at 12.30, so kind of moving things uh, uh, forward, you know, a topic is about empowering. We just got focused on retaining and hiring talent because that's step one. Is there anything else that are hurdles to actually empowering retailers and in actually unlocking the potential of the store teams? And this time around, this is what our teaser video was about. So Julian, maybe you can kick, kick us off on this issue. Uh, so what are your additional thoughts? Yeah, so look, I, I think um, philosophically, it's a really interesting question. A lot of retailers have been very successful because they deliberately didn't want their employees necessarily to feel empowered. You know, I want everyone in my company doing this on, you know, Monday at nine o'clock. And that's been a very, very successful model. I think, you know, we're now at a stage where actually we can go better than that. You know, actually, yes, we can keep the kind of framework that um, uh, guarantees brand standards and that kind of stuff and guarantees customer service, et cetera, but actually gets people focused on what they personally need to do. So in a sense, you can move to a world of kind of creating personalized work for every single person in a way that is going to kind of promote or to, 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 to improve that store in the most relevant way. So everyone can focus on what they personally need to do, but at the same time, you can keep that kind of protective cocoon that stops you going off the reservation and people ordering the wrong merchandise or ordering too much stock, et cetera. So I think for me, that's the big shift that's happening in retail at the moment, in a sense, a move from a you know infantry platoon-like mindset more to a kind of special forces mindset. Does that make sense? That makes perfect sense. A wonderful analogy too. Um, Chris, what is your thoughts on this point? Right? Is there anything else you want to add? No, I think that, I mean, you know, we did a survey a couple of years ago with the University of Houston as part of an industrial engineering project. And I was quite surprised on what the feedback was when we were trying to do design of a, of a, uh, a physical piece. And we asked associates what they like about their job or not like about it. One of the points that they, was mentioned earlier was the number one thing was that they didn't like was stress. The number two thing, and that's usually because a customer's coming into the store with more information than they have, and they're not empowered or enabled with anything, and they have to kind of smile on their face and to be, uh, you know, be the smile of the brand, but not a not very helpful. But the second thing that that was pointed out in this survey was actually uh, the concept of disassociation, which is I wear the logo on my shirt. But I'm actually not really part of the. I'm on, I'm not in the know. I don't. I'm not part of the the team. And so, you know, they. I'm at the at the far end of the information chain, and that's really not empowering because the person. I really don't know what the plan is. I get my information from a bulletin board, or I get it secondhand passed down the line verbally. If you really want to empower people, you actually have to have a point where they can access information whenever they need it, wherever they need it, and how they need it in order to do their job well. Because everybody here, all of us all have mobile devices. We all have mobile information. We have mobile access in our, in our professional lives. And you need to bring that to the, the frontline team in order to empower them. Otherwise, they're going to be a smiling face. And it's kind of hard to uh, really represent the brand well and do a good job when you all you can say is i'm not from that department let me see if i can find somebody to help you and you're you're off into that uh, common phase that we're in today so i think there's a lot here that is doable by cut by uh, retailers and I, I i'm really excited about what the future looks like in this area for those okay. that to do it Christiana smiling yeah. because I know yeah. well, where I'm she's just... going to go with this. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, I fully agree with you guys, but uh, like, I think there, like, there's a very simple reality of uh, just store hours, right? Like, I mean, retail one-on-one. And if you work in store operations, bless your soul, because you have a very interesting job of putting a lot of puzzle pieces together and you have a certain time frame that you have to work within. So, you know, I, I mean, it, it's pretty simple, right? It, it, you open a store, you have a pro forma for the store. What do you need to spend? How's it going to make money? And you need to stay within those requirements, right? Profit and loss. And so with that being said, like, there's only a certain amount of hours that you can have in a store, right? And that those are, and as you know, when business changes, those hours can fluctuate, right? But when it comes down to it, when it comes down to what you need to empower and educate your store teammates, like that has to get prioritized 
and then prioritized in terms of certain hours. So if there's only a certain amount of hours in the week, then your priorities might be more of like training around checkout at Cash App or, or, or servicing deliveries in the stock room and less about maybe selling model or product releases or new technologies or whatever it may be. So like there's the reality of we want to provide the tools to be able to, you know, like here's technology where you can learn all this about this product. But at the same time, when you have people that are paid by the hour, you they either have to work or they have to be educated and you have to find a way to achieve both and prioritize. So unfortunately, I think sometimes we sacrifice, uh, you know, maybe product stories, product, you know, information, seasonal information, brand information for operational and business information because they need that to, to hit their KPIs. But um, I think it's a, a it's a definitely a hurdle that I, I don't know that anyone has a perfect way to solve it at this point. Um, but at the same time, like it is a reality of like there's this much time in the week and you have to get everything done in it. Yeah. Can I can I go on? Can I come back on that? Because I think Christiana makes makes a really interesting point. Yeah, you know, time is everything. I think what's interesting at the moment is there's a lot of technology that uses people's time wastefully. Yeah. Um, today. Um, so, and I'm talking more about store managers and district managers, but if you're looking at a typical store manager, store manager, and I think, Sue, this comes from your excellent survey you just shared in comments. Um, you know, a store manager spends something like four or five hours every week looking at data and trying to figure out what the corporate headquarters wants them to do. <laughs> and that's basically wasted time. Now, just imagine you could get rid of all that and actually get people to spend half an hour on that or 20 minutes on that. Then, Christiana, imagine how much more time you'd have to do the kinds of things you're talking about. You know, another example, if you're a district manager, the average district manager spends six hours at the start of every week trying to work out which stores they're going to visit that week. And by the way, that's out of date by end of day Monday. Yeah. And actually, they probably end up doing exactly the same routine that they did the previous several weeks because they got into the mindset of, oh, I haven't been to that store for two weeks and just following this kind of set path. And so I guess my point here is, we're asking people to do an awful lot of things today that, that is wasteful. And couldn't we find ways to use technology to free up that time, you know, so they spend more time with customers and so they spend more time coaching their teams, et cetera. Does that, does that make sense, Christiana? Absolutely. No, it definitely does. And I mean, I think that's why, you know, uh, technology has even come in more in terms of like, how do you replace some people for things that maybe you don't need them for. I mean, obviously, you know, uh, self-checkout and things like that. But I mean, obviously that works for certain industries better than it does for others. Um, but, you know, I, I do think we're making progress there in terms of the industry. Um, but, uh, you know, then when you launch technology, you have to have the time to train someone on the technology. So all of that just keeps getting added on and added on. Yeah. yeah. And, and never-ending additions. Yeah. <laughs> so. And I would add to that. Um, I personally don't think there's there there should be very much danger of new technology um, reducing headcount in frontline workers because the retailers have already reduced the headcount probably as far as makes <laughs> sense in the physical environment um, and self checkout is one of those techniques that Christiana talked about but it's in my mind it's providing the technologies to be able to up level the work that you're asking those frontline workers to do instead of walking around with a clipboard and a pencil or you know climbing through stock rooms and those types of things if you can use data and technology tools to be able to offload some of that low value add effort um, that's a way to reduce stress on the frontline and also a way to increase job satisfaction you know i just add a little bit to what julian had had shared on the waste of time. Um, we see that a lot. And, and if you look at the, if you just go back to the other point we were talking about on new employees and turnover, tremendous amount of drain of resources and time is spent by store leaders answering the same questions, yep. doing the same things over and over and over again. Technology is a perfect fit for automating so much of that low value repetitive tasks so that managers can run stores better and have more time to do the value, value it, uh, the more important things. Um, you know, we see this all the time. The, 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 the amount of information that's pushed at new employees is so complicated, right? It has to be simple. It has to be intuitive. 
And it has to be a, something that can be impactful on their first day. Unfortunately, a lot of the tools that are being pushed by other software companies are just too complex. They literally are just too complex for somebody who's not going to be there that long. By the time that they get proficient, they may be down the road. That's not going to make an impact. And it's a big waste of, uh, of training dollars if you're not careful. So true. So excellent, right? So, so we'll, this has been a really fascinating conversation. My takeaway, my points are that clearly communication is critical, right? Real time, live, two way communication, building this culture, as Jennifer and the audience kind of pointed out, feeling valued is super critical. Having measurable action items is critical, right? That's that's kind of the point. And how do you manage time in essence? So, and, you know, Connie in the audience kind of pointed this technology should simplify the operation process and remove friction. So let's get to that, right? Like almost all of these things that we have been talking about now kind of has its answers in some answers, at least in technology and analytics, trying to solve some of these problems. And so, so I'm going to pivot to the next stage of our conversation is like, how can technology and analytics actually truly unlock the power of frontline employees and store associates. And, we, and the objective here is to really free them, right? As Chris, you pointed out, to do the more valuable and meaningful tasks. So I'm gonna start off with the first observation that was raised, which is that, you know, communication is of essence. And I think, Chris, you said only a third of the people have devices. I saw that you know Walmart was actually giving Samsung devices, if I remember correctly, to their frontline employees, to probably to alleviate some of those issues. So let's talk about how do we facilitate this communication between employees in a store, across stores, across the tiers and hierarchies of an organization. Because fundamentally, if we get this flow of information to go well, we're actually going to unlock a lot of power in these. Story. Well, I think if you, if you, you know, Gurth, if you, if you just look at it and say, if you were trying to build a cohesive team, a one team, if you will, you wanted your operate, we all know that teams operate more efficiently and more effectively than individuals. And if you really wanted everybody, if your store team to operate as a, as a team, um, you need to create frictionless communication, frictionless two-way two -way communication between anybody and everybody. And that's really a challenge for a lot of people think of communications as I need to be able to send um, tasks down from headquarters to an employee. That's communication. That's really not. I mean, that's, that is a form of communication, but really the unlock is instant frictionless communication. Because if you really want collaboration, you've got to have everybody connected and everybody be able to reach everybody in the moment, in the instant that they need it, right? Um, it would be similar if you only had one-way email. Boy, that would be, if you're on the receiving end of it, that would be great. If you couldn't send back, you couldn't reply, or if it was a real burden, you had to mail a letter back, that's not really uh, gonna, gonna be very effective. And so the idea, the real unlock is make anybody connect to anybody at any time, whenever they need it. And it might need to answer the customer's question. It might be, how do I perform this function? It might be, what you know, it, it just be whatever it is at that situation, I should have access to that information at my fingertips in a way that helps me be effective in my job. And I think that if, if, you, if you just take that as a goal and say, hey, um, we're going to do that, that's what, you know, we think that's what defines digital transformation of that front flowing team is, is the access to communication, the access to build one team or the opportunity to build one team. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add to that, right? So someone in, in D.C., a frontline employee in DC might actually know the solution to a problem that someone in uh, Seattle is facing. And now if you have this lifetime communication, you could actually use them as knowledge brokers to solve these problems. You know, right? the, that's... the reality is it, it, on that point, um, you know, the, the, the quickest way to actually answer a customer's question is actually to go to somebody who knows the answer. It's right. not to look it up in a system. It's actually, but the problem, if I'm new, if I'm brand new, my first week, I don't know who knows what. I'm working with all of you. I don't know what you know and what you don't know, right? So you could be just 10 feet away from me, but I don't know how to, I don't know to ask you the question. So luckily I'm going to go, I'm going to go find my supervisor, my manager and ask them that question. And then they're going to broker me to the person that knows the answer. Well, technology could be a wonderful way of actually intermediating all of that 
and create that frictionless environment. I think that's a huge opportunity. Yeah, and it creates value too, right? I mean, it makes them feel valued, the person who solved the problem. <laughs> um, sure. So uh, any other thoughts on this point of communication before we move on to the next issue? I mean, to, to reiterate what Ricardo wrote, like, I mean, there's communication and then there's effective communication, mm -hmm. right? And so, I mean, a store manager can get the communication that comes from corporate and says, here's everything you need to do. Here's what we need you to prove on your, improve on your KPIs. And then they are going to get their team together and say, hey, we got to do this. We need action items. Like, and, and I think when it comes to technology and like, you know, especially as AI is, is becoming more of a regular thing of like, if we say, hey, okay, we need to improve conversion in store. Well, just by telling someone that works a part-time employee, hey, we got to improve conversion. Like task them with, hey, in order to get to this, I'm going to task you with, I need you to five out of the 10 people that you talk to today, I need you to get them into the fitting room or whatever it may be. Like there is more than just telling them we need to achieve this. It's giving them tasks to be able to help them achieve that because we're just telling them a challenge and asking them to figure it out themselves. And, and what I'm hoping for with AI in the future too, is that we can have AI that is attached to our, our KPIs to help us inform of like, oh, if this needs to be improved by 1%, how might we do that? If this needs to be, if, you know, cart size is down and we need to improve it, then we should do X, Y, and Z. So I think that there's just like, there's, if, if the communication is not effective, then it's just chatter. Something tells me that Julian is going to chime in. <laughs> yeah. Christiana, I love that point. And by the way, that's what we try to do. Yeah, exactly that. So you've just very articulately made that point. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, we will talk about that point in a second, but I just want to uh, put, like, get any last thoughts on this communication issue. Is there anything else that you need to um, want to bring in, Sue? To the table. Yeah, you know, I, I, everything everyone said, I agree with. And, and also, Connie has had some really um, wise uh, things in the chat as well. Um, but I, I do think that, you know, when you're, you're in corporate, um, and you think the message is reaching the field um, because you've said it five times, um, it probably isn't reaching the field. It's certainly not getting down to the frontline workers and their managers in many cases. And, and to the point that Christiana made, it's not just about you need to improve this metric, but the whys and the hows are much more important than the whats when you're when you're at the, at the front line of retail. Um, and, and what can you do to do that? And, and what's going to make an impact? And how, how are you contributing to that? So I, I think all of those things are really, really valid. Excellent. Can I, can I just make one plea to all the retailers listening? Um, if you think about all of the information that's being sent to stores at the moment, and it's got a lot worse over the last few years, statistically, something like half a percent of the information you send each week is actually relevant and actionable yes. by that particular store. Yeah. The problem is for each store, it's a different half percent. Yeah. So next time you think, oh, I've got a great idea for another report or something like that, please stop, yeah? Because those guys are completely overwhelmed already. That's, that's so true. And, and part of my role at Macy's was, as to, was to be the gatekeeper of all that stuff rolling downhill into the stores. And what I think um, fundamentally is, a, is the crux of it is a lack of trust. Um, leadership doesn't always trust that the front line is gonna execute exactly to their vision, when really it should be a joint vision that's shared by the company and everybody's empowered to execute toward that vision uh, together in teams, individually in, the, in their own roles. Um, and I don't think we have enough trust um, in this industry. And that's why I think all of that information and reports and communication keeps rolling down because somebody's looking for the magic bullet to make things happen consistently. And the reality is when you have a fleet of stores you probably don't want consistency because the consumers are different in every market. The employees are different in every market. You want a level of brand consistency, but you, but how it gets executed in the store um, is, is much more individualized and should be. Yeah. Very nice. So this was going to be the second question is how do we actually get the right information to the right person at the right time? Uh, right. And it looks like we have a solution uh, to that problem, but um Let's just talk a little bit more about that information aspect and actually drilling down to what's actionable, right? Uh, uh, Christiana had mentioned this, Sue had mentioned this, like it has to tie into the bigger picture as well. So what is the challenge to actually getting that to happen, uh, right? How? What's the, the constraint 
to getting that customized point five, like make that hundred percent of that information that that store or that individual receives. Uh, any thoughts? And I'll just open it up to anyone who wants to say something. I, th I think sometimes it's just about simplifying the communication too, in terms of like, I mean, if, if you're in a corporate position and you're, I mean, we're planning for a year out, right? We, we know what's coming season by season. We know that when we're going to have promotions, I mean, it, it's, it's pretty easy for, you know, everyone's got a floor set by season. You have some mini floor sets, some major floor sets, and then you go to semi-annual sale. Like it, it, it's, it's not rocket science here. This is just what happens, but it's like how that is all planned and to be able to like, if you work in the store, you're not part of any of that planning, right? You're just waiting for when product hits and it, they're opening the box in the back room. They're like, oh, this is cool product. We knew that product was coming for a year. We knew it's a big thing. And they're like, oh, there's marketing for it too. Like we, there's a disconnect that I think we need to simplify of like, here are the whole seasonal plans. Here's where you're going to start to see these things versus like, I know they have a lot more bigger fish to fry in the, in the store, but at the same time, I think it's helpful to give them a bigger, broader picture, even if it's by season, than just waiting for things to arrive that week and then figuring out what they're supposed to do with them. Completely agree. And, and you know, one of my favorite quotes is by Steve Jobs, and he said, it doesn't make any sense to hire smart people and then tell them what to do. We need to hire smart people and have them tell us what we should be doing. Um, and we, we th that's a, a really good adage that retailers could could take to heart. Many retailers could. Yeah. I, I just add to that. I mean, I think um, Christiana talked about uh, simplicity. You know, I think it's about communicating those insights, those actions, et cetera, to people in a way that really is really, really simple. And we talked a bit about training the need for people to be trained on new stuff, but I didn't get trained on how to use WhatsApp. And I shouldn't need to be trained on how to use store software either. So I think that's one point, simplicity. I think the second one is specificity. You know, again, you know, to, to Christiana's point, don't say, hey, you need to sell more. I mean, that's not really very helpful. You know, if you can say this particular SKU, I can see you've got loads of stock, you know, but actually you're selling 500 bucks less than you should do. And by the way, three other people found that this was the problem. Can you go and check if that's the issue? You know, then you're beginning to get towards something much more specific that someone can actually act on. And then I think the final thing is learning. So, you know, the beauty of retail is you've got a, a you know, a, um, a store fleet with a thousand stores. You've got a thousand A-B tests happening every day at 9, 9.30 in the morning. You know, so why aren't we learning more from that? You know, why aren't we learning what someone tried there, capturing it for the company and then scaling it up? Excellent. Okay. So, so at the essence of this, it looks like technology can allow communication. It can allow learning. It can allow simplification and, uh, and, and specificity to quote the words and allow most importantly to quote uh, Chris personalization of work, right? You're able to personalize the work to each individual person and make them feel valued. Now, let, let me pivot to the next question, which is that uh, with regards to like, okay, so we got all these technological tools, be it AI, be it communication devices and so forth. How do we actually scale this to, you know, every store is a unique entity onto itself. Every team is a unique entity onto itself. So there are challenges to scaling. And it's, so when we had talked about this uh, in, in a pre-meeting, you talked about scale to enable. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's, it resonated heavily with me because having had these experiences, it's not really that easy to scale across hundreds of stores. So can we just talk about how do we actually, okay, we got these technologies, how can we deploy them to scale across and make it a unified experience while still allowing each store to operate individually to a certain extent? Yeah, so I think that's the crux of the challenge. And, and you know, um, Julian and Chris and, and, and at Microsoft, we have tools to help do that. Um, and, and, and it will it is going to require technology to be able to scale to the level that you're talking about. Um, but also, you know, one of the things we feel strongly about at Microsoft, and I think, Julian, you said this earlier, um, you know, there might be 50 different applications uh, that a retail store um, frontline worker or their manager would use every day. How can how can that be simplified? How can there be one single pane of glass that overlays that and connects it all together? And by the way, personalizes to the person's role and what they really need to do their jobs every day. You know, that's something we think a lot about at Microsoft as we're designing teams and also um, our our future roadmap for teams and working with partners like like uh, Theatro and Corso. 
Chris, you had talked about, you know, only a third of the people have communication devices. What's stopping it to be scaled universally? I, I'm assuming it's uh, fears of losing information, security, privacy. What's your thoughts on that point? No, I mean, I think that I, a lot of it has to do with usability, right? In other words, I can't, uh, I can't do my job if I have some, I cannot run a register if I have something in my hands, right? I can't, uh, I can't do a customer service. I'm looking at a screen. I'm not going to give a good service. There's just a lot of usability aspects that limit that almost across every industry. It's not unique to retail. It's the same thing in hospitality, manufacturing, quick serve restaurants, all of the above. I think that the, the, a key thing um, I, we talked on the point of simplification. Simplification to scale, simplification doesn't mean dumb it down. A lot of people think that means dumb it down, like make it, it I would go the other way and say it has to be intuitive. And, and we're, at, we're, at the, we're, we're on the leading edge of using artificial intelligence to actually make it easier and to more intuitive to help people. Because the new employee doesn't know anything. They need the most assistance right? They need the most help and so forth. And I think they, the tools that we could create could be really simple. They could be really intuitive um, and they could be really impactful. And I think that that's the future where we're going. And, uh, you know, Sue, your, your point is exactly right. Because if you're going to scale, you're going to have to either, you either fight against um, the fact that I'm going to have 50% turnover. I'm going to ignore that. I'm going to roll out complex tools and just say, that's the customer's problem. Or you're going to say, I'm going to anticipate that we're going to have high turnover. And therefore, I need to anticipate this user experience needs to be tailored to what they're, where they are in their journey of getting on board and so forth. And I think it's a fantastic opportunity to actually leverage technology and some of the things that are emerging to make a much bigger impact than traditionally the way it's been done. Because traditionally, the tools have been designed for higher end folks, the tools have been designed for, for managers or other stuff. It's not for the the lower end of the organization, if if you if you want if, if you want to improve improve the performance, you have wanted to of an of an organization. You can lift it from the top. I mean, pull it from the top or lift it from the bottom. Well, who's at the bottom? The seasonal worker, the seasonal worker who's only you know going to be there for two months, three months. Think about it. You're paying them a full wage, and yet their productivity is going to be not great because you can't afford to train them. Well, how is it that you make a tool that actually helps them meet the customer as needs and so forth? That's a really big impact. And then it is, let's tune, you know, let's tune some of the other things that we're focused on. So we, just a different perspective, I would say, when from a scale perspective, when you get into a really big organization, you got to look at things from the bottom and say, how am I going to make an impact? Yeah, I agree. And I also want to... Um add on to something Gotham said about um, worried about data loss prevention and security and all those things. Um, but one thing, thing I know about stores and frontline workers and their managers is if the retailer doesn't give them the tools they need to do their job, they will find a way to get it done and they will find a way to automate it themselves. And they are <laughs> SMS texting, they are using WhatsApp, they are using you know all kinds of consumer grade consumer facing tools to be able to communicate both while they're together in the store, when they're outside the store, all those types of things. And the retailer has no visibility to that um, and no control over it today. So that's another really big factor that I think retail needs to consider. Wonderful. Like, just look, this conversation could go on for hours, right? Mm -hmm. And I just looked at the time and I was like, oh my gosh, I'm a bad moderator. So <laughs> I'm going I'm going to actually uh, kind of call this to, and then by giving the floor back to you, maybe your last thoughts on where are things going with regards to empowering store teams and frontline employees? Right? We have all agreed it's super critical. So just your last quick thoughts to summarize uh, this conversation. And I don't have any particular order. So whoever wants to go first can go, but just keep it brief. I'll make it simple. Invest in the team. Invest in, the te invest in your store associates. They will give back in a big way if you invest in them. And I'm going to second that. And I'm going to say, if you as a retailer don't invest in them, then the, the other retailer down the street that is investing them is going to take your employees. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll go next. Um, I think, um, I guess one thing that's made me slightly nervous about this conversation is I think we talk quite a lot about tech and how great it is. And I think, you know, tech is at best a servant of amazing store teams. So, you know, we need to, we need to remember that. Um, Christiana, bring us home. 
anything yeah. else? I mean, I, I think simply put, like the the environment we're in now, things going on in the economy. Let's just let's just keep people happy, you know, <laughs> and 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 keep that positivity up. I mean, there's you know, we're constantly going to be pushing things for the business. There's going to be stress or whatever, but let's just make sure that it's a, a happy place to work. Yeah. Well, wonderful. That, that's been a great discussion. And I think we can all conclude that your frontline employees and your store teams are your differentiator, right? They do actually are the voice of the customers in many ways. They allow you the flexibility and the freedom to do what you want to do. Uh, they need an equal space to be heard. And this was an attempt at giving them that voice and trying to bring their issues. Technology and analytics can really enable giving them that voice. Thank you all for being part of the session. I'm sure if anyone wants to reach out and uh, to you, they can reach out to you through LinkedIn. Got some amazing people in the audience. I wish we were in Clubhouse where I could up them into the speaker session, but thank you all for sharing time. Uh, I, I look forward to the next conversation. We'll post this on our YouTube channel in a week or so. Uh, and we'll have continuing conversation. Frontline employee engagement is not going to go away. And we'll try to bring technology solutions and people who are innovating at that front uh, to this forum every semester. So thank, right. you, thank you. And have a great evening. Thank you. Bye. Have a good Bye. week. Bye. Bye, everyone.